Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and as Ross said, actually around the world. So welcome to our topic here, human ability. So my name's Paul Gerlin, and I'm with a company called New Habits, and I'm a project manager by background. But the purpose of this uh, presentation today is really about redressing the balance between process and about people in project management. We're going to have a look at the concept of failure. We'll have a look at what the problems are with the responses we make to that failure. We'll look at decision making and we'll look at dealing with people. And in fact, we'll bring in some, uh, what we found from working with a particular group of people, carers. That's very, use, very useful that uh, we can learn from them. We're um, an executive coaching organization. We train people as well and we work with teams. And when we started, uh, when I started the company nine years ago, we were looking for the right strap line. So we believe it's about successful change through people. People is our ethos. And so this is about presenting some of our thinking. Just a brief glance on the web. And I pulled out uh, these very interesting sets of numbers. I'm not going to go through them all in, in detail, but there were a couple that really jumped out at me that some projects went so badly, 17% of them, that they threatened the company. Look at this one, 70% of projects uh, of organizations had at least one failure in the last 12 months. And actually, I'm going to drop down to the government projects because I'm actually looking at a page. Uh, the, the failures wasted 10 billion dollars, uh, sorry, 10 billion pounds. That's over an eight-year period, and only 30% of our projects and programs are successful. That came from within the DWP. And here in today's Guardian, I'm looking at a page where it says um, the write-offs have risen to over 40 million pounds on the Universal Credit Program. And in fact, there's going to be a further write-down of another 90 million pounds worth of software as well. Software as well. So we have got this great history of failure. I think, though, if you look at the, this is going to be compounded by the fact that there's great pressure within this economic environment to deliver. There's less funding available. And what we get is we get a risk-averse culture. And managers play it safe. And we play by the rules. People keep their heads down. And it doesn't get the best out of people. In fact, the impact on morale is terrible, and we can create a bad working environment. So if projects fail and the environment is tough, what do we need? Well, we need our knight on knight in armor. Now, I've called it, I've said Prince 2, but any other ology would do. That gives us structure. We go for our clear targets and direction, quantifiable targets, outputs so that we know how we've achieved, and we have our milestones in there, our measures to know how we're going. And when we put all of that together, we come up with that most valuable of things, our business case. Because we've got our targets in there, we've got our forecasted benefits, we've got the overview of the solution, we've got a way forward as a basis for our objective decision making. And that's what business cases are supposed to be about, aren't they? Again, I dipped into, now I've got Prince 2 here. Now, PJ from within uh, the People's SIG is, is horrified about the, uh, what he perceives as a sort of character assassination of Prince 2. Um, but actually, uh, it's not about that. I'm, I'm just, what I'm pointing out here is our fixation with methodologies. Here's one quote. This one I, uh, I did find rather amusing. So we get people who can pass an exam. And in fact, this one went on to say, if however you start to feel it's a little unreal, not the way the world works, don't worry, it's not you that's got the wrong end of the stick. Now, I know that the Prince2 community and any other methodology community will say, uh, look, it's about you uh, use Prince2 with experience and common sense. The thing is, how do you get those things? Now, I'm very indebted to uh, a book called Obliquity by uh, an author called John Kay, which actually questions 
when we actually go after targets. So he gives a very good quote from Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was the most successful 20th century US president. He knows that you cannot take things on sequentially. It doesn't work out that way, and that you actually have to try something and actually make up your way as you go along. Now, I'm not arguing for agile or any other ology. What I'm saying here is that when we put more structure in place, it doesn't actually add an awful lot of value. So what about our business case? There's a sound logic. You all said we need one. Well, again, John Kay in his book quotes Benjamin Franklin who was um, uh, quite a renaissance man in terms of his range of skills, wrote to the English chemist Joseph Priestley, and he said, what I do is, when I need to make a decision, I divide a sheet of paper into two, pros on one side, cons on the other. I think we've all done this ourselves. And over three or four days, I will put down hints for myself as they occur to me. And at the end of them, and this is a bit I really liked as well, he said, I estimate their respective weights, and then I will make my decision. And I found this to be a great advantage, and he called it moral algebra. And is this not the basis of what we do when we appoint somebody to a job, when we, a uh, civil servant, presents an impact assessment to, on a policy proposal, or even is this not a core part of a business case? The thing is, Franklin knew that we don't make decisions that way. He actually, he said this. What he was saying is moral algebra was all very well. But actually, we'd use it to justify a decision we've already made. Now, I don't know about you, but as somebody who's written a business case or two in the past, I think I've rationalized decisions that have already been made. So here we are then talking about business cases, and that's saying the decision making is flawed. Another reason why decision making is flawed is, look at it, we, we come up with forecasting models because you, we may be going ahead 5 years, 10 years, 25 years, when we're in an environment that's uncertain and constantly changing. A sponsor leaves, we get a change of minister within a government department, new chief exec within an organization, things happen. The environment is very complex and so we try to simplify it, simplify it and it doesn't work because we lose some of the important information. And not only that, how did you mod what model work? The world economy, the UK economy, even local economy. We work with incomplete knowledge, therefore we will use best guesses, we will use conjecture because we can't know everything. And what about the responses of other parties? We can't honestly predict what our competitors will do, what our customers will do, what our suppliers will do. So I question then, are we truly making objective decisions or are we using wishful thinking? So now we're saying we can predefine what's, what our decision is going to be going to be. Really, we make some forecast which isn't actually reliable. And let's have a look at this project then. This project is 10 years late and it's 14 times over budget. So, was it a success? Well, clearly using our conventional uh, wisdom and our conventional measures, it wasn't. But it was Sydney, Sydney Opera House. Designed in 1957, finally built in 1973, and it received the Pritzker Prize, for the, which is architecture's highest honor in 2003, and it got that citation. And it's one of the iconic buildings throughout the world, and it's a World Heritage Site. So let's put that another way. It's not given to human beings to see or predict to any large extent, the unfolding of events. In one phase, men seem to have been right. In another phase, they seem to have been wrong. Then again, a few years later, all stands in a different setting. Now, admittedly, Churchill said this about Neville Chamberlain, who came back from Munich, a hero with peace in our time, 
18 months later, he was driven from office, a broken man. He died of cancer a few months after that. But that's actually what we could say probably about most of our projects, most of our programs. They stand or fall in the way people see them. When you think about it, if you ask all of us people from the UK, if we ask the views about the Olympics, for example, are we, do we go back to, well, was it on time, was it on budget, and uh, all the usual kind of measures, or do we actually say, actually, they were great because they had a good feeling around the country? And can you actually put measures on that sort of thing? So actually, do we ever tr truly produce an objective business case using our tangible measures? And how can we be sure we're measuring what's important? Because it changes over time, and it's all about perception. So where do we stand then on objective decision making, structure and order and measurement? Are we on a hide into nothing? How should we make decisions? In project management, my very personal view is project management is primarily about two things, decision making and about relationships. And as project managers, we make many, many decisions. If we look here about where we're going to put our effort, what we say, how we behave, how we treat others and other decisions, we're going to move into a realm now of ethics. You go to an ATM and it gives you £200 instead of £100 you keyed in. What I want to know is, what do you think most people do in this situation? We've got a clear, clear winner here where we, in, we think that, six, well, we're saying that nearly two-thirds of us are actually saying that most people would keep the money. Few would return it then because they think it's theft to keep it. A few believe it belongs to other people and would uh, return it. And some people believe 20% of it, we think that a fifth of people would be uh, doing this because they believe in honesty. Let's have a look at this next poll then. This time, we'd like to know what you would do. Don't worry, it's anonymous. We can't trace it. Just be honest about this. What do we see? This time, just over, well, we've only got half the number of people who are saying would keep the money. Clearly, then, project managers are more honest than they see other people to be, which is great then, isn't it? And actually, we've got over twice as many of you saying, uh, as, as was you saw for the population before, who would give the money back because they're honest. So that's wonderful. It's good to know that we are part of a, a, an honest profession. Actually, in real life, most people not only keep the money and try to get more out of it, they then really do who wants to be a millionaire and phone their friends to tell them about it as well. It probably shows that we know the right thing to do, but actually often we fail to do it. So we're going to have a look at these in relation to our ethics and our ethical development. The first stage of our ethical development is uh, demonstrated very well by this, this baby. It's, it's the ethic of ego then. And it's actually saying, what's right is what's best for me. And it's this internal driver that's a survival instinct. So it's, it's right for us for our first year in life. Do we ever leave? Do we ever lose that completely? Well, when you look at it just now, it's the ATM choice one. It's about keep the money. It's the bank's fault. It's looking after me. Is it feasible that we take this into uh, our adult life? Well, look at the relevance with regard to Lehman Brothers, for example, and the other banks where the traders gambled, and most of it then being uh, promoted, being uh, in terms of the great bonuses that they could uh, earn. Does it apply to project managers? Well, I don't know. I found myself thinking, my project, my project, my project, my precious, and going into a golem state there where we get fixated that the project is all that counts. So that's our ethic of ego that we should leave behind. As we begin to understand the instructions from our parents, we get to this true first moral conscience of ours, the ethic of obedience then. So this is not an internal driver. This is an external driver, which is, look, don't think about it, just obey what we do. And of course, for any of you who have 
got young children or had young children, you remember the terrible twos when they, when they in fact, we all tend to rebel against uh, the rules. However, around about the age of four or five, we learn, to re we learn this aspect and we accept it as a framework within which we work. And actually, this is our ATM, second choice. This is our one that says we return the money because it's theft if I keep it. Because actually there are rules here. And often, when you having mentioned Lehman Brothers and the mess that banks got into earlier, uh, that's, all, that's the result of what we get then is a result where the financial services uh, authorities actually have a knee-jerk reaction and put yet more rules in place. And uh, what we try to do is manage everything by rules. The problem with rules are we re rebel against them. Children re rebel against them. And actually, as adults, we rebel against them. We don't like to comply unless we're actually consulted by them about them. However, we impose them on a workforce. And they may be formal or they might be informal ones. The culture. How many of you work in the long hours culture and does that, is that not also becoming a rule for everybody else that works there? And actually a lot of our methodologies become more about following rules than they do about keeping the big picture in mind. All these people rebelled and they were all successful, all in their own way. They modified the rules by which their success and other people's success was measured. And they changed our appreciation of what's good and bad in their different professions. Where do we go next then in our growth? This is the ethic of care then. And it's, as it says there, it's what's right and what's best for all of us. It's about give and take in relationships. It's what builds communities. And actually, when you look at communities, we're talking about families, we're talking about friendships, we're talking about neighborhoods. Could it be what binds teams together well? Because how many of you work in projects which become adversarial? This is the ATM choice about return the money because it belongs to other people. This is often expressed actually as the uh, reciprocity. And this, this um, treat others as, one would, as you'd like to be treated yourself is actually in all of the major religions. Not just Christianity, it's in Jewish religion, it's... Uh, um, and it's in all the old philosophies as well, from Babylon, Egypt, right the way through into Buddhism, Taoism. It's about saying we should treat others the way we want to be treated. It's in a positive form. This is called the golden rule. It's also the basis of human rights. And one of the important things about it is, and naturally when we, if we took this into work, it's, not, it's that we treat everybody with consideration, not just members of our own group. There's an extension of this, the silver rule. This was actually couched by Confucius. And it's a negative form. And it's saying about not treating others in a way we don't want to be treated ourselves. What harm could happen? And actually, the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm uh, is, an, is actually an expression of that. It's also uh, a maxim of Richard Branson's. So reciprocity is a good demonstration of the ethic of care. After the ethic of care, we mature to the ethic of reason. Or oh, incidentally, the ethic of care, we move to that when we're in our sort of in our twenties. That's as we as we mature. We get to our ethic of reason, probably in around about our sixties. This is our personal integrity. It's what we judge to be right. It's, very, it's tied so closely to our values. This again then is an internal driver. It's expressed by this guy, Socrates or rather, this guy, Socrates. This is returning the money because I believe in honesty. So we start with an internal driver of the ethic of ego, then we move to the ethic of obedience, then we move to the interactive ethic of care, what's right is best for all of us, and then to the ethic of reason again, which is an internal driver. So actually, good decision making it's not about one of the three of obedience, care, or reason. It's about doing all three. It's about doing the right thing. The business case for ethics, well, 
in the short term, if we go by the ethic of ego, then we can get something. In the long term, though, it's not sustainable. So, how do we then make the right choices? Here, I'm indebted to Roger Steer, who's got a great book called Ethic Ability. Because our decisions are very rarely straightforward. Think of what the decisions you make within your project management career. So, this pulls together the ethics. It says, what are the rules? If I've got to make a decision, are there any rules in place? Is there legislation? Is there policy? The I says, what does my integrity say to me? Does it line up with my core values? This is going to our, uh, uh, the golden rule in terms of what benefit does this bring to self and others? This is the silver rule. What harm does it bring? And lastly, when we're talking about truth, what would happen if the truth came out? And could I sleep at night as well? So I've said before, look, if we don't like rules, how do we decide, how do we treat people then? We mentioned before about fulfillment. This is what we found. See how it compares to what you've had. We found that people actually get fulfilled by overcoming a challenge. This could be within work, outside work. Freedom then to follow one's own path. Now contrast that with having to follow rules. And this could again could be within work, without, outside of work. Give me the scope, let me get on with it. This close relationship, so I often call this giving and receiving love. Sense of belonging to a team, that was a very strong thing for people. And this concept also of I'm making a difference with what I do. You might want to think then about how these fit with yours. Another thing I would ask you is, how much of this is possible at work? How much of this is possible within the, pro uh, within the project environment? Achievement, freedom, I'm not sure about giving and receiving love, but belonging to a team and a sense of, sense of contribution, making a difference, all of that is available. All of this is what we seek. So people want fulfillment. We've been fortunate enough to work with a group of people who strive to bring about fulfillment for others. Now, some of you may even be one of, uh, one of these. When we're talking here then about carers, and if you want a ridiculous business model, this is it. I mean, if, you're, uh, if you're coming at this from a, an angle of, of uh, ego, the ethic of ego, ego we've got 6.4 million informal carers in our country. They're informal because we don't pay them anything. Now, even if we paid them just minimum wage for the hours that, uh, the maximum hours that we pay somebody, which is 48 hours, they'd be worth nearly 120 billion pounds to the, to the country. We would have to pay them that. Yet they do it for nothing. Caring is about believing in somebody's potential. How would that be for managers to do that? They focus then on what people can do, not what they can't do, and they grow what they can do. They believe in empowering individuals, helping them make their own choices, and they're very resilient. And actually, what we find now is not just from the cared for, but from the carers as well, both parts, both groups, that we all have actually vast resilience, we've got great determination, we've got great strength, and we're all very resourceful. This, by the way, is Julie. Tim and Andrew. Andrew's the one in the middle. Andrew's 19 years old, he's got cerebral palsy and he's had many, many achievements. Four A-levels which exceeded expectation and now he's on a placement with HSBC on the IT apprentice scheme. Julie and Tim though have had many fights on their hands in terms of overcoming battles with different authorities about what Andrew couldn't do because they want their fighting for what you can do. One of the fights they took on and one was getting him into mainstream education. And incidentally, hello to the other three of you because I, I believe they're listening anyway. So what can we learn from working with carers? What can we learn with regard to delivering fulfillment? How should we be dealing with other people? I want to offer you another acronym then. Focus on relationships. Build and maintain the reciprocal relationships like with the ethic of care. 
put yourself in the other people's shoes. Appreciate another person's feelings. So we're talking here then, aren't we, about empathy. This is also ethical. Sincerity. Being honest with yourself and others. This is our ethic of reason. Operate by your principles, your moral code. Again, this is our integrity, this is our ethic of reason. Empower yourself and other people to grow. This is what carers have taught us. Deal with other people compassionately and with care. And show trust in others and build trust. I've, I've come across a lot of managers who say, trust me. But what they don't appreciate is trust is a two-way street. Now, does it work? Let me ask you, what would it be like to work with somebody like that? What would it be like to be somebody who dealt with others this way? Does it work? Well, I'll offer you this organization. Mark Adelson, I'm very lucky I've spoken to the guy, and he's great to listen to. Beaver Brooks, then. Jewelers at the upper end of the high street. Oh, nearly 800 staff, 60-odd stores. And Mark is the MD. When he took over, the staff didn't feel valued and they weren't developed. And he had a dilemma. And the dilemma was, what's the ethos of the company? Is it about making a profit? Is it about making a difference? For him, it was about making a difference. And this company is incredible. 20% then of post-tax profit goes to charity. 31% of the workforce uh, support workplace giving versus 4% in the national average. They give every employee two days a week and £60 for them to invest in a charity so they can go and work with underprivileged children, whatever it is they want to do, and they can also uh, support them financially. What does he get back though? So what does this organisation get back? It gets back 17% attrition. Now, that might sound high, but that is a fraction of what you get on the high street. And 1% in the HQ. People love to work there. They're an empowered workforce. They're connected. They take pride in the organization. They are consistently in the Times top five, uh, in the top five places to work, and Mark is consistently one of the top business leaders. You see what he said there, it's not enough to make a profit, it's how we make it and what we do with it. And a term that's come out when we were, we've got four or five of these different case studies, is it's the right thing to do. That's come out repeatedly. He talks about it being consultative paternalism. And it's about enriching the lives of employees, suppliers, customers, communities. And there's a concept there of tell the total truth faster. So treat everybody with respect and dignity and like adults. And we have adults to adult relationships where if I've got a problem with you, I tell you about it. That's showing integrity. Right then. So we've been through a lot here. I want to bring it all together. Projects fail. Well, they, they fail when we're looking at time, cost, quality. But on the other hand, do they necessarily fail? Because people really measure things by perception. So as project managers, I'm saying to you, don't just use the left brain. Don't just hide behind the structure, the targets, the measures, the objectives, and the decision making. Don't get that ethic of ego, the ethic of greed, which is it's my project, it's my precious, and therefore it takes over everything. Look at the big picture. Make right decisions. Use respect in the dealings with the other people that you're working with. And look to bring fulfillment, because that is what brings sustainable success. We call this human ability. Now, this human ability is what's in the our chapter within the Gower book of people in project management. Human ability is about recognizing humans' ability. It's what carers have shown us. It's about empowering. It's got humanity within it, about being humane, being benevolent, showing care, showing reason. And maybe we can all learn from some of this as well, about humility, about not being too proud of yourself. So, as I say, we call this human ability. 
I believe we're going to succeed in projects, but also I'm rather hopeful for, uh, for Spurs as well. But I leave you with this as a final word, poignant on the day, the, the day of his funeral. Really good question from Rosie here. Can human ability r exist in a bonus-driven organization? I believe it can, actually, because Beaverbrook still operates with a bonus. But I suppose it depends on if you make bonuses purely down to the uh, individual performance as opposed to team performance. So, some, uh, Elizabeth, thank you very much for your comment about you will dip into the book. We also need to be empowered ourselves to enact on the principles presented from Gavin. Yeah, it's true. Um, uh, there's an organization that we deal with that calls this courageous integrity. <laughs> Bennett, good, good to uh, hear from you. How do you respond to those who say time is money? I go back to the short-term case for the ethic of ego is short-term results. Is it sustainable? No, because people don't trust sharks after a while. I think that it's not just time is money, it's about investing in people. Because when you look at the project environment, people are the one consistent thing throughout it. Projects are delivered by people, for people, so it's about getting the best out of the best resource we've got. Oh, thanks, Ian. That's a really good question. How do we develop hindsight before the event? Um, Ian, that's a, that's a great question. I would, uh, I would say that the right decision-making in terms, therefore, of uh, what the rules, integrity, what good will happen, what harm will happen, what if the truth will out. I think there's a lot of very useful, that makes a great framework. And, and sound it off other people. Have I ever worked with any City of London banks? No, but I'd like the opportunity. Uh, we do look up, we, we coach people within organizations at all levels, very, very senior people. We do work with a major bank as well. It's difficult to work in a human ability way if other PMs don't work the same way. It's difficult to take the big picture if you're working on that. Uh, Ryan, I, um, I think that's a very telling uh, comment to make. It is very difficult because um, you can therefore end up taking what is the short-term view, the selfish view. In my uh, project management days, it is fair to say that I worked in large organizations, uh, a large financial institution and a very large government department. So my projects, while some of them were being delivered partly externally, um, were all, when I say in-house projects, you can imagine I was part of a very big project environment. The thing is, we're going to work with people again in the future. So what we're investing now is about reciprocity when we need uh, favors. I have long believed that people are the most important aspect of projects. Do you think there is a general shift happening towards recognizing this is the case, or are we still on the starting line? I suppose, Colin, some people are further off the starting line than others. I think that's a really good question. Look, when things get tough, I think a lot of managers get tough. They take a short-term view, and that's what that's what happens. Um, you look at many organizations, if you look at government projects, they're, despite the fact that they are supposed to be running for uh, impacting us for decades, we're actually really worried about will we get elected again. So the, the culture that builds up of short-termism is very, very hard to overcome. Erica, that's a very important point. Senior management team would also need to be on board with regarding measuring project success. How would you help them see that a project should be based on what's the right thing to do? Look, this is not a shameless sales pitch, but this is what we work with um, management teams, project teams, we work with teams about, which is about really helping them understand their decision making and what is it linked to. I think the, our human ability approach is about building sustainable relationships. Something I say on a lot of our, our groups, uh, when we work with groups, we all have uh, gr a group of people, uh, a network of people that we can go to for favors. We also um, have a network of people who come to us for favors. 
Now the not surprising thing is actually they tend to be the same people and they have come about as a result of reciprocal relationships. We trade with one another. That grows to care, it grows to trust. You can't, you can't generate those in no time. So we are talking culture change within organizations. <laughs> nice one, Paul. Am I implying that setting up well-structured projects is a hindrance to success? I thought this would have come out much earlier. I, I was um, expecting probably a posse of angry people. No, I'm not saying that. However, I think what we can do is we can get locked into a left brain activity, which is put order, structure, sequence, putting all the processes in place. And actually, the most important ingredient of any project is people, because look, Everything that's ever been created, you know, in terms of humankind, has is, is come from people. And it's not necessarily all about imposing structure and order. Uh, you've only got to look at the people who've broken the rules. Uh, we, I'm saying, Paul, I think we really need to challenge the mindset and maybe look wider at what we see success to be. Yeah. Merv, I think you've really answered your own question here. You said, does this have to start at the top with the sponsor or can it start on the ground floor? Look, I, I'm all in favor of a pincer movement, bottom up, top down. But don't do what so many organizations do when they go, right, we're going to follow this as our latest fad. Let's commit to this. If the sponsor lives it, breathes it, if the, the sponsor then um, is as at Beaver Brooks, you know, with Mark Adelston, then it, you know, he lives it. I'm not saying the man's a saint, but to consistently come out as high as he does as uh, one of the top leaders to work for, he's clearly doing something right. However, it's now percolated through the organization, and it's the ethos of the organization. So I'd go, Merv, we're from bottom up, middle outwards, top down. 